Good evening and welcome to everybody. Um, yeah, as, as usual, it's always good to see a great crowd on a Friday evening. And um, tonight is a, it's slightly unusual in as much as we've got um, two of our own members presenting. Um, we often have an academic and and sometimes um, one of us, as it were, but but tonight I was so impressed with Andrew Thornett's um, progress over the last year and the huge amount of stuff he's managed to put together and the data he's, he's, he's uh, managing to get out. I thought um, it would be good that his enthusiasm would be allowed to um, permeate our, our own labs and observations. So without more ado from me, Andrew, um, it's over to you. Share, please. All right. OK. Um, now I need to, we did try sharing before. See if I can get it work again. Where's that share button gone down here? Um, and uh... Right. Can everyone see that? Yes, it's all good. Right. Um, now, there used to be a picture on there that showed the uh, showed those two aerials um, back to back, the two, the two uh, mesh aerials. Until somebody pointed out they were actually slightly unusually configured <laughs> so at least uh this way around they're more sensible no oh, actually no, no, that's right that is the still the back-to-back -back one sorry that is wrong they, they, they have actually moved now so that they are alongside each other for people who are wondering what on earth they're like that for anyway so uh yes lovely to have a chance to speak to you all so thank you very much indeed for inviting me um so uh, my name is andrew thornett and i live in uh, litchfield just slightly north of uh Birmingham uh, in the UK, which is, uh, if you're not from the UK, is smack right bang in the middle of England. So we're about as far away from the sea as we can get uh, get here. And uh, as, as I've been built up a lot there, as having achieved the last few months, and in, indeed I have, I've got to point out that is with a, a massive amount of help, especially from people from this group and, and from Sarah. And I also want to point out that uh, I last had a go at uh, Radio Astronomy about 10 to 15 years ago, when what was remarkable about my attempts at doing it then was the complete, utter, total um, lack of success that I had in almost anything I tried, including trying to detect meteors and things. I had a situation where I had a meteor set up. If I, I took it away from my house and put it somewhere else so I could detect meteors, as soon as I brought it back to the garden, I couldn't. And that basically uh, typified anything else I tried, really. So, but this time around seems to have been an awful lot better, which is which is absolutely marvellous. Now, I, I've been uh, quite ill over the last few months and obviously quite a negative thing to suffer from a significant illness, but um, it was a chance to uh, to make use of that time and do something to both take my minds off the illness and also to uh, achieve something that I wouldn't otherwise have been able to do. And I'm very excited indeed to have this chance tonight to be able to share that with you. So without any ado, I'm going to continue. I've only got an hour. I have about a, um, 70 slides. But when I started this uh, this talk, I thought to myself, how on earth am I going to fill an hour? Um, but then uh, after about two days and I'd hit about 100 slides plus, I thought, ah, maybe it's going to be the opposite way around. Um, I am listed as talking about um, hydrogen line observing, but I I've extended it a bit. To, uh, I'm covering that hydrogen line observing definitely, but I'm actually talking more about what I would say, setting up a radio observatory uh, in my back garden, uh, which is that shed at the end there at the back, um, and uh, an excitement and all the different sort of projects I've been able to do. And I reckon if you're going to do something like this, you you, you have to uh, uh, at least have an aspiration. So to give myself a real aspiration, I've given myself a name. So uh, I'm now Litchfield Radio Observatory, which you can all have a good laugh about. I do have a uh, um, a radio moniker, as you can see there, um, M6THO. For those who are radio amateurs in the UK, you will know that that is just the foundation exam. So I don't really know much at all about radio, but uh, um, it tells you a bit about the, the legal framework, etc., and how to use a, a radio set. And my website, which uh, you may find of interest if you want to chase, uh, chase everything up, including some of my live feeds. Okay, moving on. So I've got to start this off by giving a whole pile of thanks. I, I could not possibly have achieved anything at all uh, that I'm going to show you tonight were it not for these people um, and a range of others who helped me out. Andrew Thomas, who we're, we're still waiting to join us, actually, I think I, I put something on the BAA forum, uh, RAG forum, and uh, 
he then contacted me and said, oh, I've got this uh, this ex-military array and I, I was going to have a go at doing the hydrogen line stuff, but I haven't got time. Uh, would you like to have it for a bit of a donation to charity? And uh, I went up to uh, his house and we had a really good chit chat and uh, um, I now have that array. And I'll tell you in a minute or two the rather strange reason why that array has been brilliant. And it's uh, just to give you a heads up, it's not because it's particularly brilliant to picking up hydrogen line. <laughs> it's for a different reason. And then Sarah, um, the whole concept that caused me to get interested in this in the first place was, was Lester, uh, who created his uh, scope in the box contact. Um, and that was actually what we got interested in the first uh, first place. And he gave a lot of support initially. And then the, the chap the two I'd credit more than anything else, which is Ted, who is uh, online tonight, who is really, um, I, I describe Ted as my mentor. He, he, uh, he has been incredible. And his software, the uh, EZRA software suite has, uh, um, has just revolutionized how easy it is to get Hydrogen 9 stuff working. And for those who don't read the SARA journal, not a member of SARA, the latest edition of the SARA journal, the, the winter edition just now, has 23 references uh, in in articles to uh, Easy Radio Astronomy software suite, um, just showing how useful people are finding it. It's, it's a set of Python scripts, which just you'll see in a minute or two, and you can make your own mind up what you think about them. And then from uh, UKA and uh, BA, um, so uh, just got a whole list of names there, and a chat from my own astronomy group here in Derbyshire uh, who, who have helped a great deal. Right, moving on. I already mentioned that, so we're one of the one. Um, so I'm going to start off right at the beginning by throwing in my summary advice rather than waiting to the end and giving the summary advice. You can have it right at the beginning. Um, when I, I gave a sort of a, a brief uh, version or version of this a few months ago to uh, to this particular group, um, and at the time I thought I would be talking to people who'd all done it themselves, um, and uh, really. Um, was teaching people to suck eggs, but I was surprised at uh, several people who contacted me afterwards. And a typical sort of statement was, I've been considering um, messaging, uh, sorry, um, detecting hydrogen in the Milky Way and, and mapping out the arms for a long time. I've even got the kit collected together and you've encouraged me to get started. And these were quite experienced radio astronomers, far more experienced than myself. So therefore, I think it is worth still giving you some of that advice. So... Yeah. Get support and advice from people uh, here or in SARA. Do realise, unless you really do know an awful lot, that it's going to take a lot of time getting it working. And that's because you're going to have to make mistakes and restart. And, but don't get discouraged by that. That's the process. Making mistakes, it doesn't work. Try again, try again until it starts working again. And don't feel embarrassed that you don't know enough. At least that's especially relevant to me or anybody else uh, online or is watching this on the YouTube uh, who thinks, I don't know enough about this stuff. Don't worry about it. It doesn't matter. The, the tools that are now available are absolutely fantastic. You'll get it there if you keep going. The other thing i got to say, which is I think is actually quite important, and I don't mean to be offensive in any way to the various people who've sent me advice which contradicts what I did. I'm sure their advice was very good. But there are often multiple ways to skin a cat. And... If what you're doing works, then don't get too worried that somebody else does it differently, particularly if they then write an email to you and say, oh, you shouldn't do it that way. You should do it this way. At the end of the day, they might be right. Maybe if we did it their way, it would uh, you, you get a more effective detection. But honestly, if you're getting what you want and if it's getting you excited, then maybe continuing the way you are and then coming back later to try and improve things and improve the signal noise ratio and get better detection and more detailed findings is something you can do at a later stage. But it's so important at the beginning to be encouraged to get some results back um, and uh, to keep your enthusiasm going that you, you don't want to be knocked down too much. I, I would say in um, alongside that, that there's absolutely nothing wrong in my mind about having about different people's doing things in different ways. This is our hobby. And the way that one person wants to do radio astronomy or any, in fact, astronomy full stop um, and can be quite different to somebody else's. So some people on this group today will be really, uh, what makes them, their heart flutter is, is looking at the actual kit, trying to get uh, the best, uh, perhaps the best aerials or the best uh, 
um, software or the best uh, um, computer setup or, or receiver setup or whatever. And that's brilliant because everybody else can make can build on their uh, shoulders and uh, make use of the the things that they've done. That doesn't mean that you personally have to be interested in those things. We each have our own bits of the hobby that we enjoy uh, most and, and makes uh, makes us tick. So that's absolutely fine. Um, <laughs> and one final one I threw in. When I started doing this, I thought, you know, the beam width on uh, my area when we calculated it was something like sort of 20 degrees or something like that. And I thought, therefore, it doesn't matter if I put an accurate elevation and azimuth uh, in uh, in my calculation in the software because uh, the overlap would be so great. Uh, what I discovered is it does. I don't know why, but it does. Um, otherwise, the things start to go wrong in the, in the maps and things. So, and... You're wondering how you can measure it well your mobile phone free apps that will do uh, a digital inclinometer don't even have to go and buy one these days just download one free of charge uh works very well uh, and a compass although make sure you stand a meter or a meter or so away from your metal aerial when you're trying to use your compass otherwise it'll give you a completely wrong reading and something else some of you guys i know in your radio astronomy work will be using uh, thing using um, uh, Raspberry Pis. Other of you uh, might use uh, Linux-based systems, and you don't have this issue. But when you've got Windows, as I have, um, up Windows updates are an absolute nightmare. Whatever um, I uh, seem to do, um, every time the computer hit an update, it would stop the various bits of software from working, and then end up having to restart everything again. But then I came across this fantastic little bit of software free on the internet, Windows Update Locker. Works marvellously. Plus, it's got this very simple window. Turn them on or turn them off. Oh, well, simple as that. No complicated playing around with the registry or anything else to uh, to, to actually get things to, to work uh, and seems to stop the problem. So if you want to use Windows for doing radio astronomy, I thoroughly recommend that you get download yourself a copy of Windows Update Locker. Right, so um, this uh, comment I, I, I think is actually quite important. Although I have um, done the foundation radio exam a few years ago, um, I thought it would teach me a lot about how radios work. Um, it gave me some very brief overview of that particular exam. I've never got around to doing the intermediate exam, which I'd like to do one day. Um, I might start learning something properly about how radios work. It was really covering the... Uh, um, the legal aspects and the, the basic protocols for using a radio, which which weren't really that relevant, to be honest with you. Um, so I still consider this last few months that I've been doing something with very little knowledge, really, and very little understanding of many of the concepts. Uh, I'm a, a medical doctor um, in my job, and I know a lot about that. And I know what it's like to have expertise uh, in an area. I also have spent many years doing um, visual astronomy, uh, visual observing and also more recently um, astrophotography and I know quite a lot in those areas but when it came to radio astronomy I was basically um, starting with virtually nothing and so the story tonight is of being able to achieve a lot even though I had so little information uh, little knowledge and experience um, I put there this is a true representation of the astrophotography I, I sometimes think that the main reason for astrophotography is not to take pictures. It's actually to see how many miles of cabling you can actually put on one tripod. Certainly with my setup, it is. But I put there, um, is this what you want to do with uh, light pollution at a level that uh, matches or is worse than the COVID pandemic? I would say in the last year or two, a worse problem has been clouds and rain and storms which have made it virtually impossible to do any visual astronomy or astrophotography. I've also got a spectroscope or spectroscopy either. It's been very, very difficult and certainly very impossible to plan anything. The other thing that's changed uh, recently um, about uh, radio astronomy, which has revolutionized these things, uh, is actually how much it costs to actually do stuff. As I said, I had a go at this previously in uh, 10 to 15 years ago. And in those days, if you wanted to buy a receiver, I remember I bought an Icon, uh, Icon R 
seven thousand. I mean, some of you, some of you guys remember the the Icon R seven thousand receiver. I can see one or two people having a bit of a smile. Um, and that actually cost me uh, two hundred pounds uh, off uh, um, eBay at the time to buy that, and that was relatively cheap at the time. Later on, I bought uh, an I a, a sort of a smaller Icon. Um, yeah, sorry, no, not Icon. Sorry, Yatsu uh, F eighty seven. I think it was. Um, and that cost me five hundred pounds. Things were quite expensive um, in in trying to actually do radio astronomy, especially when you're wondering, do I buy that or do I buy myself a Teleview eyepiece for my visual observing? It was a bit of a, a trade off, um, which often um, switched off wanting to explore further into the radio astronomy route. But now these software defined radios have just blown the whole thing to smithereens. You can go onto um, Amazon for thirty pounds. You buy yourself a receiver, which is better than the stuff I've just mentioned to you. It's certainly better than my ISU and far better noise uh, levels. And uh, uh, so, for example, in meteor observing, um, the uh, FunCube uh, dongle Pro Plus that I've got uh, just smashes the ISU to smithereens in terms of trying to detect uh, meteors. Um, and it's got a far less current draw, so it's, it's costing us less on fuel and taking up less space in the... Uh, uh, in the shack as well so uh, and, and it means that for around about 200 pounds you can actually get into some quite serious amateur radio astronomy far better than any joke stuff something that's some real results and demonstrates some amazing findings as you'll see in a little while how am i doing on timing 1948 so uh just a bit of honesty as i said to you i don't really know a great deal about this um, I can, uh, if we ask some questions at the end, I'm quite happy to have a go at it. But if anybody else has got a better answer, please do chip in and say, Andrew's got that wrong. This is the real answer. I will not be offended. OK, so I was um, keen to get started and stuff that was pretty much out of the box, uh, rather than stuff that required a lot of knowledge for the reasons that you've seen. And so a lot of this stuff at UKRA, which is the UK Radio Astronomy Association, which is a, a um, charitable group, um, run by volunteers here in the UK, a sales kit, which is very well designed and very well made. Um, and uh, Sarah sells a lot of other excellent stuff. And there are other projects in the States, which uh, which are also uh, very effective. Again, often aimed at high school students or um, first year undergraduate students, and therefore aimed at just the sort of people we are, people with an interest, certain amount of knowledge of astronomy, but no, not really any real great knowledge of radio astronomy. And they work very well, and often the manuals with them are excellent. So a few things. I just put this list in because uh, traditionally all three of these things are supposed to make it impossible to do radio astronomy, which is uh, something that's supposed to have very low signal levels, uh, destroyed by noise. Well, I live just around the corner from Tesco's. I have uh, five or ten metres down the garden, better than some, but not particularly brilliant. And right in the middle of a town, so there's loads of radio interference, and everything you're going to see tonight has been detected from that location. I do not have access to somewhere that's very remote. Right, so this is what I thought I might be able to do, measure some meteors, perhaps detect some solar flares with the SID monitor, um, do a bit of Jupiter um, stuff maybe, and then I had a dream that I would be able to detect the hydrogen line in the Milky Way, but I wasn't sure if I'd be able to achieve that or not. So that's what my aims were back in August this year. Now this is what I've got stuck in my shed, which you might have a bit of a giggle about, which is a tower of uh, mini PCs. Um, I, I've discovered that trying to stick three or four projects running off a single computer tends to get very confusing. And when one goes down, it takes everything out. But these little things, I don't know um, what computers you use, but uh, these are little Windows machines. They are uh, run by uh, basically using offices because they're convenient and small. And there's basically no secondhand market for them. Because if you're buying a computer at home, you should buy a laptop, don't you? Why would you want to buy a mini PC? They don't come with a screen. They don't come with a keyboard. So as I put there on the left-hand side, 85 quid buys me a Livono uh, i5 with 8 gigs of RAM and 256 gigabyte SSD. If I want to knock it up to uh, an i7, Sorry, instead of i5, perhaps 16 gigabytes of RAM, 512 gigabytes SSD, I might get to 120 pounds. So you, you can, um, it, it that's another thing that's changed everything. You can now get a very cheap computer, takes a very little space, low current draw for, for power consumption. 
and allows you to use Windows. So for those of us that are very reluctant to go down the route of trying to le learn Linux, then it's a way of getting into it. The Linux route, I might say, may well be probably a better route, but when you're getting started, there's only so much you want to take on at one go. Um, I'm using real VNC, so I remote access into these things. All right, so so I'm going to go through my projects a little bit one at a time. So this is my uh, Meteor Scatter radio. Uh, for those who are wondering, it's not the one on the left-hand side. Uh, it's, it's the square thing on the right-hand side, which uh, a radio amateur uh, hand-built for me here in Litchfield. Um, but normally people use this HB9CV uh, antenna, which is not that. That's a Moxon uh, that Bill made for me. And we're trying to detect um, signals that come from uh, an atmospheric detection centre called Graves in France uh, on this particular frequency, 143.050 uh, megahertz. So th there's a picture of Graves. Um, I wish that was my aerial. Looks pretty impressive, doesn't it? But uh, um, And initially, when I started doing this a few years back, it was with this Yaisu uh, here, which had some success, but wasn't uh, uh, wasn't enormously over overly successful so um but now i use a fun cube uh, dongle pro plus which i said before is a much lower noise level and uh, a much more steady noise level which seems to be quite important and these things they're literally just uh, a simple dongle size but i mean that's that one's relatively expensive about 100 pounds or so but uh, uh, most of the projects that i'm using the dongles are now using a 30 pound dongle off amazon so the graves thing just for those who have never come across meteor observing before so the basic idea is you've got the transmitter which is the graves uh, site that you saw a minute ago and it sends a signal up um which as far as we're concerned it is over the uh, curve of the earth so we can't detect it but if it goes up and hits something in the atmosphere which bounces it back down then we can detect that bounced signal back that comes back so it's uh, a, a meteor radio scatter the radio comes up and it bounces off so you're detecting on the same frequency is the transmitter and you get some peaks um, on Spectrum Lab, uh, which is another free piece, wonderful free piece of software, which I highly recommend. I quite like the 3D plots on Spectrum Lab. Here they are. I just think they look pretty impressive. <laughs> I know many people tend to use the 2D waterfall ones, but uh, I think these look pretty good. So here's some example of various meters, meteors being detected. And uh, I've now got it so it loads up automatically to the RMOB uh, website, which I know many of you do actually load your detections up to. And I was able to see the peak of the quadrantids uh, yesterday, which was quite nice. You can see the level go up and come back down again. So I'm very pleased. And you get some strange traces. Maybe one day somebody explain these various traces to me, what they imply. And here we are. That's uh, just showing uh, at the time uh, um, the quadrantids there um, so on the fourth. And you can see the level starting to go up as it comes into the shower. Uh, it, by the color change from uh, it, these are relative levels so blue doesn't mean zero it just means that relatively there are less meteors than the, the colored ones and you can see the peaks going higher there up to at one point at midday a, a peak of 42 i was picking up that's per hour i think and this is a similar thing but uh, a few hours later and you can see the peak has come up now and it's gone back down again so it'd be quite interesting maybe in the chat afterwards but some other people can say whether they also detected it at midday on that day it doesn't matter whether you did or didn't i won't be offended but i'd like to know whether i got the right time or not i found i've gone bonkers on all this radio astronomy stuff that big circle is uh showing my live feeds i've actually now got uh six live feeds which you can all see on my website if you're interested which is uh it's either astronomy.network or astronomy.me.uk they both take you uh take you there if you want to find out more about uh, the things that i've done and you can leave some um Post, sorry, some quotes, what I'm talking about, sorry, some comments. Uh, very glad to hear from anybody who would like to uh, comment or give uh, some uh, constructive uh, criticism. I really greatly appreciate it. Right. Next thing I've got is sudden atmospheric disturbance monitoring, um, or SIDS, as they're called. This was one thing I got working quite well 10 years ago. Um, so the basic idea here is that you have a receiver that uh, picks up signals that are being sent at very, very low frequencies, um, VLF, very low frequency. In this case, the main one we tend to use is 23.4 kilohertz. Um, and it uh, these are signals that are being sent out for, as I understand it, for, for nuclear submarines. But again, somebody correct me if I've got that wrong. Um, and uh, 
uh, clearly we can't. Uh, people always ask me this: Can you actually understand what they're saying to the submarines? No, we can't. It's all all coded. All we care about is the total power, and that goes through those signals travel through the ionosphere uh, around the planet um, and allow um, submarines underneath the uh, the polar ice to receive those uh, those signals uh, because it's so low frequency, which travels through almost anything. Um, and uh, the uh, we can show it, say whether that power is changing. It turns out that if a solar flare hits the atmosphere, then that causes the total power to change. And you can pick up typical changes in the power of the signal, which um, re um, uh, indicate that a solar flare has occurred. And I've got a couple of different types of SID receivers, one from the UKRA. Now, this is just one channel, one frequency, but it, it does a better job. It, it, it uh, amplifies the signal far better. But uh, Stanford Solar Observatory in the States produced the Super SID monitor, which um, actually uses the sound card in your uh, in your computer as the receiver and just acts as an amplifier. Um, and, and that's not as not as good as taking the signal away from the noise level. So you, it, the, this UKRA one will detect more of these SIDs, but it's got one great advantage, the Super SID monitor, which is its broadband across quite a range of frequencies. And therefore, you can actually pick up multiple transmitters from different places that have slightly different frequencies. And you can then uh, sort of check if you've got the, the same SIDs being picked up on these different uh, different directions. It then confirms for you that you're getting a, getting a SID and it's not something else. It's some other atmospheric effect. So here's, you can get another good laugh here. Um, this is the inside of my shack there, at least one sub part of it. Uh, was actually a tiny bit of space there between something with a, a couple of these uh, um, aerials up. So the, the aerials for a SID monitor are uh, about 150 meters of uh, of aerial. But the, the good news is you can just uh, um, twist it around a, uh, a cross shape, as you see there, rather than having to try and have something go 150 meters. Um, and you can put it indoors as well. It works very well indoors. And there you are, that's just showing the signals reflecting off the ionosphere and bouncing around. Um, okay, right. Now, I want to just uh, say here that uh, I don't know whether um, he's on online tonight, but uh, the owner of SID Station, absolutely marvellous, uh, marvellous website to uh, pick up the, uh, um, to compare your own results with, which I go on to all the time. Um, and you can see, I, I, I nicked a picture of him there, of his website, to uh, just to, because um, it gave a, an excellent example of this this so-called sharp spin pattern, which is typical of a sudden atmospheric disturbance. As you can see, I've I've circled a few of those, and I've given you a sharp spin so you can see the uh, see the comparison. So these are the typical sort of traces you get, and that's telling you that uh, those are three um, clear solar flares that have been picked hit the atmosphere at the time. He's actually very conveniently marked the various solar flares that were in that day, so you can see which ones where there seems to be a pickup or something. Um, but uh, uh, the ones where there's not. These are examples of mine from my own uh, uh, own setup there. Not quite as uh, noiseless as his, and I'm wondering whether that's because I've got all that little stack of mini PCs in that shed. I might need to do something about that. So perhaps uh, put them in a little box or something. And there's me comparing some of my pick up with some of his, um, which, as you say, is not quite as good as his. And that's an example of uh, what you get from the super SID receivers. That isn't the plot at the end. That's just an ongoing detection moment by moment. And you can see the different peaks, which are the uh, those, those tall peaks that you see there. They are the, the various transmitters that this is picking up rather than showing a, this isn't showing a shark spin because that's over time. This is an instant of time. Uh, and you see it's got multiple receivers being picked up, or sorry, multiple transmitters being picked up there. Right. The next thing, Radio Jove. Well, this is one I haven't actually got working yet. I want to come back to it. Um, about, say, 10 years or so ago, um, my uh, my son at the time, uh, at the age of eight, was uh, there um, soldering together the, uh, the, the the 120 or whatever is different components that make up Radio, radio Jove receivers of the time, um, waving a 320-degree soldering iron around while a couple of us were trying to hold the board for him to do it. We, we all came away with blisters on our fingers at that time. So uh, but I'm keen now to try and get it uh, trying to get it working this time around. 
I did actually take it to the um, what's it all not called the uh, the peak uh, star party uh, up in uh, Derbyshire a, cu uh, a couple of years. Um, and uh, my claim to fame was I actually got filmed by a BBC Sky at Night uh, TV programme to have a, a segment on there with, with, with the receiver, which was hilarious, that filming exercise. But then I got uh, knocked off the show schedule by children with uh, with rockets, which I suppose were more screen friendly than a, a balding middle aged guy with his radio astronomy kit. So I find this picture really quite uh, quite amazing. It, it obviously isn't anything that an amateur has picked up. These are professional details. Well, the, the Jupiter one, I'm not sure where the, the, the visual picture, I'm not sure where that came from. But the, um, but the point about it is it gives you an idea of how big the radio footprint on the sky is with Jupiter compared to the, the visual picture that you see, because those are to scale, there's two of those. And it turns out that as Io goes around uh, Jupiter, it uh, leads to the production of uh, um, radio signals. I, I believe it's by synchrotin radiation, which I don't really quite understand. Um, but And so you get this beam of uh, radio waves that comes around with Jupiter, and we can pick it up here on, uh, on Earth at about 20 megahertz. I put that picture in, but to be honest, I don't understand it, so I'm going to jump past it. This gives an example of uh, the type of Jove receiver that we put together on the right at the bottom, that they use a different uh, radio now. And you can see there in um, uh, school in the top left-hand corner, somebody up in the Arctic Circle, it looks a bit on the right there, sticking up these uh, these Radio Jove uh, aerials, which are quite impressive when they're up and, and make a good talking piece for uh, a star party. But somebody else who has been perhaps a little bit more practical. Apparently, this was the first first version of Radio Joe, <laughs> which uh, before they got there, the bigger aerials. A few more aerials there, just showing it, and some examples of the type of traces you can get. So, so Radio Joe will pick up a, a Jupiter signal, but it will also pick up a, a solar flare as well. A slightly different way of uh, detecting solar flares. I just need to find some way of sticking an aerial up in my much smaller garden in a way that my wife doesn't actually object to. More of that later. So something else, magnetometer again, 10 to 15 years ago. Uh, the other thing that uh, I, I bought at that time was a magnetometer, but I never actually got it working. But uh, my grateful thanks to the guys from uh, the UK RIA this time and some very helpful uh, Zoom meetings we had together where they talked to me through step by step at a real idiot's level, which is exactly what I needed on how to get this working. So I now have a working magnetometer in my shed as well. Uh, brilliant bit of kit if you want something a bit different. So here we are. This shows the uh, magnetometer data um, from uh, LRO there. And you can see some variation. One day I'll understand some of this stuff and what it means. Yeah, Andrew Thomas in particular. I don't know if Andrew's on uh, on yet, but uh, or if, several hours of his time is what I would say. He was he was absolutely marvelous, absolutely marvelous. <laughs> I've called them nearly live readings. Uh, Radio Skypipe has uh, an FTP uh, upload function, which is supposed to make it easy. I, I, I'm making a bit of an issue with this because I had real problems. Um, so I should mention, first of all, another piece of uh, free software is available online called Radio Skypipe 2. So, again, if you've never used this, it, it's brilliant. It is what it uh, what you can see on there a bit, really. It, it's it's a, it's a charting program. So you stick a signal in and it just charts the, the level of the signal. Uh, but it does a little bit more than that. It'll pick take up to eight different channels at the same time and, uh, and, and do various things with it. But... Uh, great piece of software it's also got the function to allow you to upload your data uh, sort of semi-live um, as you go along but I've discovered that the, one of the problems is that the options for secure FTP on Radio Skypipe are very limited uh, and my website which I got with Ionos um, does want everything to be ultra secure and I couldn't make that setting so I ended up having to set up a free website at this ft.gd which is in i think it's called infinity you know it's great set five gigabytes of space don't need very much space for this and i just upload the picture to that now and then uh, and then from my website 
do a redirection so that you can uh, see the actual results. That sort of took more time than anything else getting ready work, actually. Now, my latest bit of fun at uh, the uh, European Astrofest in February, I'm actually going to be talking about this um, at, at the conference there in uh, in Kensington, um, is are actually muon detectors. Now, our next speaker is going to be talking a lot more about muon detectors. So it just this is just very brief in passing. But just to say, I, I bought a couple of these before Christmas from the UKRA, and they're absolutely marvellous. Uh, it absolutely blows my mind that you can actually set up your own large Hadron Collider in your house, don't even have to go out your backyard. And it makes use of the fact that the atmosphere above us effectively works as the collider, completely free, 12, uh, sorry, 20 kilometers of completely free um, particle collider above your own heads. And in come the cosmic rays, smash against those atoms and molecules and knock off various fundamental particles. And you have your little uh, detector at the bottom and blah, you can pick it up and go, wow. And I've got one actually on my left here to my computer. And as I'm speaking to you, I can see it flashing away. So, uh, um, in the last uh, 147 hours, my detector has picked up 900,263 muons. Now, those uh, those uh, didn't all come from cosmic rays, but uh, um, uh, but uh, nevertheless, it's quite amazing to think that uh, I've picked those up. So here we are. Here's the detector. And whereas the Lodge Hadron Collider is, what, uh, 12... Uh, miles diameter or, or, or sorry circumference or something this one's only five centimeters or so in size uh so uh um it really fits in any old space that you that you want <coughs> <coughs> you know so i've got two there and i said i bought two of them um the reason you have two is because when you've got one you can pick up uh the muons coming in various directions and muons are produced uh, in the earth as well so um, not all of them will be uh, due to cosmic rays. There is an argument that the ones coming from the Earth uh, are relatively stable, so it probably doesn't matter too much as long as you take it as relative rates. But but if you get two on top of each other, and if you're prepared to spend a little bit of extra money and have two, then there's a thing called master-slave configuration uh, or, or coincidence mode where you only count the muon if it actually goes to both detectors. So if you think about it, you see them on top of each other like that, that means it either has to be coming from the top or it has to be coming from the bottom in order to uh, affect both detectors. If it comes from the side, it'll only hit one or the other, and so you can just rule those ones out. Um, again, you might say, well, how do you know they're not from the top and not the bottom, which is the question I've asked. Um, and what I've been told is it doesn't matter because the ones from the bottom are coming at a constant rate. But I'm playing around with some lead at the moment to see whether I can get a more absolute, uh, absolute rate. So uh, this is what I've just been telling you. Okay. So uh, the, the UK, there are various people that make these, um, but the UK RA, um, uh, have got some for sale at the moment. And you can either buy a kit to do it yourself if you feel um, handy with soldering iron, or if you don't feel handy with soldering iron like me, you can get one ready-made. And it's only a few pounds more um, because these guys are so um, so great. They'll do it uh, of their own free time to make it up for you. So just charge you a little bit extra for that privilege. This is all based on the cosmic watch muon detector, which is an American idea. And so if you don't fancy anything from the UK RA at all, there are some other people that make it in the States and elsewhere. But also you can just download the plans from the cosmic watch website yourself. You can buy your own components and just make it from scratch. You don't even need to, uh, to, to buy one from a, a manufacturer. The only comment I would make on that is uh, that uh, if you go on to eBay, somebody is currently at the moment selling the scintillator which is the plastic um the, the plastic little boxy bit you need to have inside of it to uh as part of the detection mechanism and they're selling the scintillator alone for about 120 pounds so i'm not sure that making it yourself is a necessarily cheap uh way of doing it unless you happen to have access to some of the components um through an institution or something but certainly it's there you don't have to buy it through a, a formal organization like the ukra and here's uh, um, not actually live on here, but it gives an example of a of a live chart that uh, is actually detecting uh, muons um, at uh, LRO, um, and they've got some, some lovely bit of software that they've got that just make again it's just out of the box basically. You just uh, this is the Cosmic Watch program. It just uh, um, will pick up the stuff and record it to your computer, 
and we'll, this is actually also this charting website where you can link the muon detector to the website very very easily indeed um, and it will just chart it on the fly for you and if you're interested in seeing that in action if you go to my website you'll be able to see the live business that's occurring oh this is a bit of video can you see it does it, does it actually it is actually animated and working yeah great yeah so it gives you an idea of what you see uh, with uh, various detections coming in there um I haven't got too far with my own experiments with this, but one thing I have tried is to see whether I can pick up a day-night variation. It's supposed to be some, but uh, personally, I've not been able to pick it up. You can see over two or three days there, it's uh, the first bit of peak is just at the beginning settling down. But then over two or three days, it doesn't seem to have meaningfully changed between day and night. So over Christmas there. So uh, and I know that somebody else described the same um, fame phenomena. So it, it suggests that probably these detectors are not sensitive enough to pick up the, the difference. And I've also, as I said, I was playing around with a little lead to see what difference that made. At the moment, um, adding in up to four centimetres of lead has made a slight difference, not a great one. That's actually four centimetres of lead turns out to be three kilograms of lead, which I thought would be more than enough. So I've, I've ordered another three kilograms, stick a bit more underneath it. <laughs> a, um, a heavy weight of lead doesn't go a long way. If you do go down the lead route, by the way, make sure you don't lick your fingers afterwards. That's me speaking as a doctor. Not very good for your liver. And do wash your hands. And preferably wear a glove. Right. So, um, right. So a few things for those people who haven't got these muon detectors from UKRA. A, a few lessons I thought that uh, be worth passing on to folks. Um, this is me with with not a great deal of knowledge of, uh, uh, of the whole thing. Um Again, I'm using it through Windows. Um, the first thing is that there is an inbuilt driver in Windows um, for, for the, the serial, um, the USB serial thing that, uh, that comes from the muon detectors. And according to Cosmic Watch, you don't need, you can just use that. It works absolutely fine. Only if you've got a Mac do you need to install a, a driver. That is a load of rubbish. My Windows 11 machines, uh, just will not work with the latest version of the driver. You have to go online and you have to da download the 2014 driver, which you can now get online. Make sure you keep it on your computer in case it gets taken off online. And I think it'd be worth UKRA actually um, themselves getting a hold of that version of the driver and keeping it in a repository somewhere so they can send it out to people. Um, and that, uh, that that works fine. The other problem is that the... Uh, Windows Update has a habit of constantly updating the driver, which is why the Windows Update Blocker program that I mentioned at the beginning is so useful to stop the process. Otherwise, you keep having to reinstall the older driver all the time. Next thing is that the uh, um, if you're not an expert on Python, as I'm not, um, you install your Python and there's various dependent uh, well, I said files, they're really libraries that you need to uh, need to install for the Python that you're using. And there's a couple of required dependent ones, which if you don't use, it doesn't work. Now the instructions of Cosmic Watch do clearly say this, but it's really, really important. The uh, UKRA detectors are powered via your PC USB socket. It is in the instructions. You'd think it was obvious, but if you've never done these things before, you're there at the back looking for a power socket and to confuse matters there was a 3.5 millimeter stereo male to male audio cable connector at the back which if you don't look too closely looks suspiciously like a power socket and you're wondering how on earth to get a power cable to plug into it and what voltage you should use which is what i did uh, i've got a reputation in my astronomy group i'm the guy that makes all the mistakes i'm the chap that walked into my double into my french doors and bent the dew shield on my telescope I'm the chap who uh, had somebody else's telescope fall off uh, um, my, uh, oh, uh, yeah, mine's gone completely blank. <laughs> oh, I did forget it. I'm also the chap that's uh, that's dropped somebody else's ethos eyepiece. Somehow we got away with that one. So uh, yeah, uh, I, I'm the guy here who's, come, who's testing all this kit for you to find out where things can go wrong if you're a complete idiot, with me being the complete idiot. The, the two, um, if you're using coincidence mode, the two of them connect together power-wise, in fact, and data-wise, just using um, a uh, a male-to-male audio cable. 
Um, GitHub is uh, where you find all the Python uh, files. Um, and But what is not necessarily obvious is that there is a really good instruction manual, but it's on GitHub amongst all the Python files. You know, there, there isn't, uh, on the GitHub thing, there isn't an obvious thing that says, bear in mind the, uh, the, the, the instruction manual is down below. It is on the Cosmic web website, but there's an awful lot of stuff on the Cosmic Watch website. And as you're plowing through it, it's easy to miss that bit at the beginning. Right, now the main uh, main aim of the game is to talk a bit about the uh, the hydrogen line stuff. And I've got 15 minutes left, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about that in my last bit of, of the night tonight. So uh, hydrogen has a frequency of 1420.405 megahertz. Um, and this is what's absolutely blown my mind, the ability to actually be able to do this um, at home with minimal experience and, and the data I'm going to get in a second. I, to me, anyway, at least, is phenomenal. If I can do it, anybody else can do it. This is uh, a quote that I got from Radio Astronomy for the Amateur by Dave Hesseman, which is like a 1960s book. Um, and he said, mapping procedures are time consuming, often frustrating, and uh, the process uh, involves a lot of complicated calculations. Basically, he's saying, it's one of the most ambitious projects that you can do. And therefore, unless you really know what you're doing, stay away from it. It is an example of how things have changed so radically that that is just not true in any way, shape or form anymore. As I said before, what thing that's changed radically is this, this, this reduction in cost. Things have just dropped like a stone. And the Scope in a Box project from Sarah, which comes as much as anything with the most phenomenal instruction manual. A an absolute idiot's guide from start to finish about what exactly to do and their um, their own setup of software to use, which is, uh, which is really good. In particular, I want to mention uh, SDR Sharp, which is one way of doing this and one that they, they recommend. The problem is it can be difficult to get the latest version of SDR Sharp software to work when you're doing this particularly with a, a plugin for it called IF Average, which you need. Um, anybody wondering what I'm talking about, if you started on this, you'd, you'd come across these terms, IF Average. Um, but if you get their version of uh, SDR Sharp that they've all set up, all the plugins are already installed. It's an older version and works brilliantly. So recommendation, uh, contact Lester there, Vanestra at uh, Sara. Um, get hold of uh, his scope in the box package. And he's very happy to give it to you, even though uh, and don't get carried away with the fact that on the Sara website, it says they could sell the kit to you for £350 with, uh, with with all the bits and pieces you need. Obviously, that's from America. They won't deliver outside America. Um, but he's very happy to give you a complete list of exactly what you need. You can buy it all off Amazon, which is what I did. Just go and buy it um, and use his instruction manual, his software, and it will work for you. I then... I would say upgraded to easy radio astronomy later on, which I think is even better, but certainly the scope in the box software works fine and is a very good place to start. But then Andrew Thomas gave me this Farmigan Triffid military array, which works fantastically. This is 86 centimeters by 86 centimeters. As you can see all the little uh, tubey bits, they're the different dipoles. So it's an array of those dipoles, phased array. Um, and it's got one feature uh, oh, there. one feature which makes it stand out from any other aerial I could use and you're thinking I'm going to say to you that it's 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 got better sensitivity or whatever I don't think it, it probably doesn't really um, it's uh, I think it performs about the same as any other 86 centimeter aerial um, what makes it stand out more than anything else is that it doesn't look like an aerial and my wife declared so it's like a dish and my wife declared I could not have a dish in the garden we just built an extension she didn't want the dish to spoil the look but she was OK with this because apparently when this is flat, it looks like a barbecue. So uh, that one got the permission from the significant other in the household to allow me to have it, which is the most important thing about radio astronomy that nobody ever tells you. You're not going to go anywhere unless the person that makes the decisions in the household agrees. And radio astronomy requires stuff left around there for a long period of time. So I can see a lot of nodding heads there. So you've obviously been there. <laughs> uh, but bear in mind, I've got a massive shed and two enormous uh, cupboards inside the house, completely full of optical uh, and uh, astrophotography stuff. So uh, going too far down the most obvious radio astronomy route was, was not going to go very far in our household. <laughs> right. 
Okay, again, just a comment for those of you who are coming from a non-radio astronomy background. Um, there's this thing called calibration in, uh, uh, in in radio astronomy, where you, which is basically the same as using flaps and darks in astrophotography, it helps you to pull out more signal over the noise and get rid of the rubbish background. So you have to do something to calibrate the aerials. Um, the uh, uh, this is a 50 ohm dummy load stuck on the end of uh, of my receiver. Uh, to which with uh, which you need to do something with the uh, um, SDR sharp, and that's what I used. That works absolutely fine. Um, but uh, as I'm now using Easy Radio Astronomy, it's got a different method, which is to actually every other sample just to offset the signal detected by three megahertz from 1420 to 1423, and use the 1423 um, sample as the uh, the calibration signal. A great advantage: you don't have to change any uh, aerials, and because you're doing it every other sample. It also gets rid of the problem with temperature changes, which for those of us in the UK here, it is a really big problem that we face all the time. It goes up and down like a yo-yo, day and night and everything else. So it, it just helps you to get a bit of a better signal out of it. I have mentioned easy radio astronomy before, so I'm not going to stay on that. But uh, SCR Sharp's absolutely fine, but I just think easy radio astronomy is just, well, it just thank you, Ted, for writing it for everybody. It's all I say. And here's an example of uh, the uh, the live data collection from Easy Radio Astronomy, and you can see there the uh, the hydrogen signal in the middle there at 1,420. Uh, for anybody starting this from scratch, one particular lesson I would like to say is you might see a single line going straight up, very thin, and think, ah, that's hydrogen. It is not. Single line going straight up is going to be uh, either interference from something else or alternatively, quite a lot of the software-defined radios um, will actually produce a line uh, at the centre frequency, so that can catch you out. The calibration will get rid of this stuff for you, but I uh, um, don't think that means you've necessarily picked up hydrogen. The hydrogen peak is broader, as you can see there, um, and uh, and therefore once you've once you've seen it's a bit like catching a fish for the first time. Once once you've done it, you think, oh, now I know it forever now. Now I decided to make this really um ultra modern technological mount which involves some pieces of scrap wood and a few a few screws and a screwdriver um and it works incredibly well oh and a load of uh uh plastic tie things as well to actually attach my uh, farmigan array to it so uh, yeah that works brilliantly you don't need something fancy but you do need to, be able to change the elevation as you can see there i've just got a few hinges and things on it and those pieces of wood with holes on allow you to uh just get set different elevations. Bigger problem I had was with humidity. So I, so I stuck me, uh, somebody gave me this spare laptop at the time, which I'm still using for this. Uh, there you can see my um, receiver on the left-hand side. Um, for those that are gonna ask me the question, I've removed the gold thing now that's a, a preamp, which turns out isn't, isn't actually necessary. So for somebody asked me about that, it's not necessary. Biggest problem I had was you'd open it in the morning and there'd be water dripping off everything in large amounts. Um, so I bought this little caravan uh, dehumidifier, uh, 60 quid off Amazon, which works brilliantly. It's now as dry as a bone. So there's the, the hydrogen thing. Now this here is, um, you might think it shows the same thing. And that's important. This The scope in the box um, project suggests that you buy the new Alec mesh aerial, which is at 1.7 gigahertz, which apparently works fine. Um, but New Alec have now produced a new aerial. It is the mesh one on the right-hand side. Um, obviously, Farmigan ex-military arrays aren't very common. In fact, uh, I defy anybody to try and actually find one. Um, so th th these mesh aerials work quite well, as you can see there. The, um, so one is my Farmigan array, and one is this new mesh aerial from New Alec, which is actually now uh, tuned to 1.4 gigahertz. Again, available on Amazon, um, about £100. Does the trick. And here's an example of the data being it's been collected in is in easy radio astronomy and you can see there so that so there's a background map there which is not my background map <laughs> that's one that uh, ted has put in there to show you where the radio sources are in the milky way and the green uh data is, is mine covered at different elevations and you can see there the peaks are going over when it hits the uh, it's the milky way and here is uh, my data which is uh it, it's a um, from wikipedia i picked up a uh, um, a, a map of the Milky Way there, um, which is the sort of grey stuff in the background, but the coloured stuff is mine. And you can see there that uh, I've clearly uh, picked up the Perseus arm, 
uh, something of the norm router arm and the signature spurt and probably somewhat more stuff in there at the moment. So, I mean, that just blows my mind that with something 86 centimeters in size, I've got to do that from a backyard after four months of work. It gets better. If you think that's it, it gets even better. I've got to slip a tea before I tell you about the next bit. So I've mapped the Milky Way. Surely that's enough for any man. No, rubbish. That's just a bit more uh, up to date. Just giving a bit more detail. It's this. So how about proving, well, not proving perhaps completely, but certainly highly suggestively indicating the presence of dark matter in the Milky Way from your own backyard? Have you ever done that before? If not, now's the time you should get off your backside and do it. And all you need is a 80 centimetre area, or maybe even smaller than that little horn, or you can build your own cantella. This apparently work quite well as well from a, an old food can. So what we got here on the left-hand side is not my data. This is uh, from Wikipedia um, for comparison, and it just shows um, the uh, the velocity, or the speed of the movement of planets around the sun. Uh, and as you can see, the further away you get from the sun, the slower the planets become. We all know that. The, the length of the year of the planets gets longer and longer. Um, and this is uh, what Kepler described, standard Keplerian rotation. So that's not mine. The one on the right is my data. And this shows, uh, this time in kiloparsecs, the sun's about eight kiloparsecs. I haven't got any data lower than about four kiloparsecs. So about four to eight kiloparsecs is what I'm picking up. And you can see there that what I absolutely am not getting on my velocity chart from the Milky Way here is something that's the same shape as the Keplerian rotation on the left-hand side. In fact, I'm getting something which is far more horizontal, which is meant to be the sort of like a wheel going uh, round and round where the outer side shoots around much faster than the inner side to stay in place with it. Um, and that's closer to horizontal. And that is what has led one of the major smoking guns for the idea of dark matter. Somehow we have to explain why that rotation is not occurring in the Keplerian way on the left-hand side. So I'm just absolutely, absolutely amazed that uh, I can produce data from my own backyard. Probably not the best hydrogen data ever. Certainly not the biggest aerial. Probably not optimized as best as possible. But there it is, uh, demonstrating dark matter or the likely presence of dark matter from the middle of Litchfield, 400 meters from Tesco's in a highly... Uh, um, um, a radio polluted environment. Incredible. So I found this, uh, it came mind, but, but I, I found this on the internet and I thought this was pretty good. Um, so this shows on the left hand side sort of Keplerian rotation, and on the right hand side, it shows uh, um, this sort of uh, wheel type rotation where the rotation doesn't change. And if you look carefully at the red spots, you can see on the left hand side that the red spots are, oops. See if I can. The red spots are moving slowly compared to the center. On the right-hand side, they're moving much faster. I thought that was pretty impressive. I think that came from Wikipedia as well. For anybody thinking of giving a talk uh, to the BA, one thing you have to bear in mind is it then goes on to YouTube, so you just have to be a little bit careful of uh, um, copyright on things. Uh, and then... I'm not going to say anything much about this because uh, I, I don't understand enough of it to make comment, but um, Easy Rage Astronomy produces about 350 charts, something like that, for any set of data. And, and this one here is showing uh, roughly how much mass there is at different distances from the center of the Milky Way out to the sun. So this is, uh, now this time I've got the array set up because uh, I'm attempting to produce uh, an interferometer. I haven't got very far yet, but again, if you're going to do anything, have yourself a good monitor. So this is now the uh, um, uh, the Lich uh, Lyra, isn't it? Lyra, I think they said uh, Litchfield interferometer radio array, which is because it doesn't work. So you could have to say something. <laughs> uh, I tried making uh, using a power splitter to try and get it to work. I'm having real problems with this at the moment. This is the bit where I think I've really bitten off more than I can chew. But how many picks up the hydrogen? I mean, that's not the same as getting interferometric signal. Anyway, there we are. Okay, doesn't show any much. Um, and this is where Julian helped me because I, I my soldering was a bit pathetic. And uh, again, I know in um, in the next meeting uh, next month we're having a, a chat about uh, interferometers 
Um, and I'm really much looking forward to that very much to get some help. Um, I have some of these lab chat things, which are really quite handy. Um, but what's really revolutionizing things at the moment is this uh, AD8302 chip. So these little boards you can get, these are, are, are phase comparators. So they'll compare two signals coming in uh, and tell you whether they're in phase or not. Um, and they're like six, six pounds each, six to 10 pounds off Amazon or eBay. So very cheap and uh, uh, enough to blow a few while you're trying to get the process sorted. Um, Mike Ott uh, sent me some interesting uh, advice um, about uh, could I just uh, time hold up? You, hold you to time in a little fairly soon, please. Andrew. Sorry, yeah, I, I very nearly finished. So I'm going to jump past this particular one, um, other than just to comment that uh, he was the one commented that I got the line wrong between them, um, and that if once you've got it working, it should work quite well, especially with the sun going through the uh, through the beam. Let's uh, just forget that. Right, this is me come to the end. So just I'll finish there with some uh, some contact details. If anybody would like to uh, contact me on anything to do with this or anything else for that matter, very happy to hear from you uh, and have a chat at all times. I'm very happy to talk to anybody about all things astronomy. And uh, I also like to ooh and ah over other people's kit and findings. So uh, you can tell me about everything that you're doing as well. Thank you very much indeed for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. Andrew, thank, thank you very much for that. Um, I'm going to say, have a short question session for Andrew and then hand over to Martin for his presentation. So if there's a few short questions, we'll take them now. Either just pipe up and sing out or uh, type them into the chat. I have a question for Andrew. Hello. That, okay. um, that um, Windows app to block the updates, I missed where you said you could get that from. Just if type, could... yeah, just, just go to Google and just type in Windows Update Blocker. Thank you. Works well. If you've got any problems, uh, any of this stuff, I, mean, I, I have only achieved what I've achieved because of wonderful help that i've had completely free of charge from people here and elsewhere um, and i'm very happy to give that uh, as much as i am able that same support back to anybody so any problems at all just contact me and i'll and i'll do my very best to try and help out and get things sorted for you uh, a link's just been popped into the chat for uh windows update blocker any more questions so what I suggest we do then, I'll ha call Martin to do his presentation and then take questions for Martin afterwards and then maybe have a, uh, a communal question and answer session. Martin. Okay. So... A gentleman we met at Ukara who has built a very impressive muon detector. Martin, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. So I hope you can see my slide. Can you? Yes, we can. Okay, very good. So uh, again, thank you very much for having the, opp the opportunity to present my uh, work regarding the Sri Lanka of uh, detectors tonight. Uh, I had really had to smile when Andrew um, mentioned uh, that he is a medical doctor because if you, it reminds me uh, about uh, Star Trek and uh, the original series and uh, the running gag with uh, McCoy um, I'm a doctor and not an engineer. So I'm a doc. I'm not a doctor. I'm an engineer, but not uh, a particle expert. So um, if we talk about uh, uh, particle physics uh, tonight, um, as Andrew mentioned, uh, you can call me a lot, but I'm not sure if I can really answer uh, questions regarding particle physics. So anyway. Um, what I would uh, not do is uh, talking about uh, what uh, cosmic rays uh, are. I think uh, that uh, is something you know. But I want to remind you um, about the, the detectors for uh, cosmic rays. Um, one you might not be familiar with is the electrometer. It's a very old uh, kind of uh, instrument. Uh, um, Victor Franz Hess used uh, to uh, um, detect the cosmic rays, 
But what is more familiar to, to you is surely the Wilson Cloud Chamber, Geiger Müller tubes, scintillation de detectors like you use, uh, CCD and CMOS uh, like you can use with your uh, smartphone, and last but not least, the water Cherenkov detectors. So for me, if, from a point of view of a very curious um, engineer, the question uh, was, is it possible to build a working water Cherenkov muon detector at home? So first we should remind uh, um, Remember, what is uh, Cherenkov radiation? It's it's really simple because it's similar to uh, to the uh, the sonic uh, boom. Um, if uh, a charged particle is moving through the electric medium with a velocity higher than the speed of light in that medium, then along a cone, a light is uh, emitted, and in the water, this light is blue. Um, perhaps you have seen these, uh, these images from a nuclear reactor, um, hopefully only from, uh, from the screen, not uh, in real time. And uh, I'm sure you can, uh, can imagine that this is something we will not see with uh, our cosmic ray detector. What we can see are just uh, short flashes of uh, blue light short flashes, that means some photons. Um, well, when I did some, some uh, research, I uh, came about these, uh, this stuff. Um, Phoebe is uh, a supplier for um, educational um, purposes, and they, they uh, provide something they call a cameo cam. So it's a simple water Cherenkov detector um, consisting of uh, a basin or small amount of water um, and uh, a photomultiplier. And uh, when, you, when you look in the internet for, uh, for that uh, with Google or something else, you'll find a lot of papers um, regarding how to construct uh, such a, a cameo can. And um, it seems to be very easy. Um, in the UK, you have a a saying I really like, uh, the proof of the pudding is the eating. So if when it comes to the eating, all these papers fail. And uh, for me, the eating is uh, having a look on, uh, on uh, real data for, uh, for, uh, for, a for a longer time series. So that means not just for some seconds, but for several days. You will not find any time series in these uh, papers. So um, anyway, I thought by myself, let's give it a try because it seems to be easy. If you want to build a uh, um, water Cherenkov uh, detector, I really recommend uh, don't use the papers I mentioned. Use the papers coming from the Pierre Auger Observatory. Uh, especially there is a design report available for this observatory and you can get a lot of very useful information regarding the construction of, uh, of such a detector from there. Uh, the Pierre Auger Observatory, I'm not sure you know that, um, is a set of water Cherenkov detectors like this one with a diameter of several meters and uh, spread over an area of about 10 square kilometers. So it's a really huge um, observatory, but uh, there is no use for an amateur to do it the same way. Um, I think uh, we can have a lot of fun building just one of these detectors. So what is this one of these detectors uh, consisting of? Um, it's simple, it's uh, a basin of water and it's a, a detector for the photons and that's a photomultiplier. Um, perhaps you know this uh, type of photomultiplier, it's a 913. Um, this is not suitable for uh, water Cherenkov detectors because of the small area, small uh, sensitive area 
you need uh, something like this one. Uh, this one has a, a sensitive area of about six centimeters in diameter. And then next you uh, need to have is, um, well, a basin of water, like uh, this uh, glass cylinder. And uh, yes, it looks like uh, a flower vase and it, it is one indeed. And um, this is what I used for doing the first tests uh, to evaluate um, the, the system, um, the simple system. Um, I started with the set of that. So I, I put the, uh, the um, PMT into this simple housing had that uh, empty glass cylinder, and I started uh, doing the counting. Started doing the counting with what? Uh, well, unfortunately, I had a high voltage power supply from uh, Philips and uh, an uh, impulse noise interruption counter from Siemens. And all I needed in addition was uh, a special power supply for my uh, PMTs. So I started, as I said, with an, an empty glass cylinder, just uh, because looking on the error budget, just to get an idea about uh, the detector background noise. Um, where is this detector background noise mainly coming from? It's, it is coming from the discharges inside the photomultiplier tube. And uh, after having an idea about this, uh, discharge, this background noise, which uh, depends on the, the uh, high voltage you use for, this, for the power supply for your uh, PMT. Then I um, filled the, the glass cylinder with water. Yeah, next uh, thing we need to think about in the error budget is that uh, there are not only cosmic particles, muons, producing this Cherenkov radiation, but even radioactive particles. Fortunately, I'm living in an area um, with uh, about the 300 million years old limestone, and that, that means a really low radioactive uh, background. But anyway, I checked it, um, and uh, I think I, I'm uh, able to um, ignore the background uh, in a way I will show you later. The next thing uh, in the error budget are photons. That uh, might sound um, a little bit uh, strange because photons are exactly what we want to measure. Yes, that's right. But uh, what we want to measure are the photons coming from the Cherenkov radiation and uh, not photons are uh, coming from uh, outside of my installation. And this was, was something I really need to learn the hard way um, because uh, having the complete system really light tight is hard stuff. And uh, last but not least, the last thing um, we need to think about is uh, a possible absorption of the Cherenkov radiation, which is blue light by uh, anything which uh, colors our water. Something which colors our water in a, a yellow color are iron ions. And uh, this yellow light means that uh, blue light is absorbed. So what we need to use in our water Cherenkov detector is uh, distilled water. So, this is, is the setup for my, in my, for my first version. Uh, so on the top, you can see the electronics. I will explain uh, in the next slide. And this is a setup with uh, the photomultiplier tubes. Uh, as you can see, I'm using three. Uh, that's an idea coming from uh, the Pierre Auger Observatory. Um, I use these three uh, combined with the coincidence network to be sure that uh, I really have, uh, um, I, I really do measure events coming from uh, cosmic rays and not events coming from uh, 
the detector background noise. So I use, uh, to improve the, the efficiency of my uh, detector, I use reflective coating. That's simply an aluminum foil wrapped around uh, the glass cylinder filled with distilled water. And uh, yeah, this is what I mentioned before, um, what I had to learn in the hard way. Um, and all that stuff is wrapped in uh, a, a black plastic sheet as you use it, for example, for building pools or ponds in your garden. And then at least everything is packed into a steel drum uh, to have it again, um, to have it light tight. Uh, if some of you remind that steel drum about a Newton telescope, yes, that's not wrong. Um, in the former life for, of that steel drum, it was a tube of a Newton telescope. So that is uh, um, the schematic of the electronics. You can see the three uh, photomultiplier tubes. All of these uh, tubes are connected to one high voltage supply. Um, every uh, photomultiplier has its own amplifier. And that's very important to uh, improve the signal to noise ratio, the discriminator. With that uh, discriminator, I cut off uh, near, nearly all the noise, but uh, the background noise coming from background uh, radiation caused by radioactive particles. And uh, uh, I cut off the noise mostly from uh, inside the photomultiplier tubes. Then our coincidence uh, network comes in. And uh, as a result from that network, I have uh, the countings for one of three uh, events, two of three, and three of three events. Each of these events are counted and then sent uh, to a serial line to a controller. I'm sorry, it's not a Raspberry uh, because uh, the, of the lack of uh, serial connections uh, to a Raspberry. That's the reason why I'm using a banana pie. I need uh, at least one serial connection for the counters and another one for the GNSS uh, sensor to achieve the correct uh, uh, time and date. Um, yeah, the next version um, I uh, installed was uh, a version nearly similar to the first one, but with the second one, I provided one high voltage supply for one photomultiplier tube. Uh, why that? Um, well, the reason was simple. Um, I was and I'm still not sure if what I do measure are really cosmic rays. I do measure something, but um, I'm really skeptical about what I measure. And uh, I think that's a, that's a good way to get good results. So that's the reason why I provided one high voltage power supply for each photomultiplier tube and a high voltage monitor for each uh, power supply. And uh, every monitor consists of, uh, of uh, an AD converter uh, with a resolution of one volt. So I'm now able to detect any changes um, more than one volt in the high voltage power supply. And uh, well, to make a, a long story, a story short, uh, there was no difference in the results between the version two and the version one. But anyway, now I'm sure that uh, changes in the countings are not coming from changes in the high voltage power supply. Uh, yes, and uh, this is the eating, or these are the results, and the results, results are um, a little bit strange in first place. Um, so I tried to compare uh, my results. This is the, 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 pink, uh, the pink time series. I compare, tried to compare these results uh, with the Newton monitor, uh, a neutron monitor 
uh, based on in, in the high mountains in Switzerland, in, uh, on a Jungfrau Joch. Um, yes, that sounds uh, um, silly, but uh, the problem is um, there are not many uh, stations available with uh, current data around the world. So the nearest to me was uh, this station, station in Jungfrau Joch. And uh, if you compare them by yourself, you uh, surely agree um, this is strange. This doesn't look to be similar or to be um, something uh, which uh, represents the same. That means um, cosmic rays. So yes, that's right. But uh, on the other hand, uh, the question is, can that data be compared? Because uh, I have an altitude difference of about 3,000 meters. I have uh, nearly the strange longitude, uh, the same longitude, but uh, a different uh, latitude. And uh, so the question is uh, indeed, can the data be compared? So I did uh, a second approach. And this time I was uh, able to find the data from uh, a station in Finland and uh, this data looked a uh, little bit more like uh, what I measured. Uh, besides, to be sure that uh, it is not really nonsense I'm uh, measuring, I added uh, more uh, detectors to my setup. So I built up a second set um, of detectors and uh, these showed the same results. And uh, I did uh, some measurements with a simple scintillation detector, and I had uh, nearly the same results. Not as detailed as this one, but uh, it looked similar. So for me, um, this is not uh, completely wrong, what I'm measuring, but uh, I'm still not sure what definitely I'm measuring here. But well, as I said, this looked a little bit more what uh, like uh, what I uh, achieve. So I did a comparison of my time series with a completely uh, different time series coming from a magnetometer. And uh, with that, that remind, reminds me much more of what I do measure. And uh, then I need to think about uh, uh, the theory. And the, the theory is that there might be or there is a uh, solar modulation of the cosmic rays. And I ask myself, it perhaps what I see here in my time series is exactly that solar modulation. So the next version I'm currently uh, starting to deploy as soon as it uh, stops raining, hopefully it will uh, um, in the next days, is uh, adding uh, sensors for measuring the pressure, temperature and humidity. For that I am using a, a Bosch BME 280. Um, I'm adding a magnetometer, it's a, a three axis FG4 uh, flux gate magnetometer. From, S, from FG sensors in Slovenia. And uh, I want to use uh, the GNS ads, which I'm currently only using for getting uh, the uh, correct time and date to get the, the, the ionosphere data from the EGNOS, uh, ESA EGNOS service. So more improvements. Uh, so let's call it a, a version uh, three. We'll be uh, having a larger detector area. Currently, I only have uh, uh, a detector area 170 millimeters in diameter, but 700 millimeters in height. Um, why larger detector area? That's simple. I'm currently uh, using an, an integration time of 10 minutes. And uh, if you do a, a Fourier transformation on that data set, you cannot uh, distinguish between 
uh, periods resulting from solar or from, uh, from uh, other um, uh, sources. So I'm not sure if I have uh, 24 hours or 23 uh, hours, 56 minutes uh, and so on. So that's the reason why I want to have a larger detector area. And uh, the next improvement uh, will be um, deploying more detectors over a large area. So I'm currently looking in my uh, vicinity for people willing to host uh, these uh, water Cherenkov detectors. And uh, the next thing will be uh, having a scintillation detector with a larger area. So I think about uh, something about uh, 70 centimeters. I fortunately uh, got my hands on the on the scintillation um, scintillation detector with that size. So hopefully it will work. And uh, yes, um, and that's the reason why I was really really happy to be able to uh, give the presentation uh, tonight. Um, I think uh, there might be a benefit from having something like a, an amateur cosmic ray network, mainly for, uh, um, for uh, having a discussion and uh, having access to data from other, uh, from other sensors um, in Europe to see if what we measure, of, if what I'm measuring is uh, really coming from cosmic rays, modulated by the solar, or by, by, by the sun or not, or if it is just uh, nonsense. Because, because what I say in the beginning, um, I'm a curious uh, engineer, but not a, a particle expert. So last but not least, uh, some uh, reference, it's only in, in a selection, uh, from my point of view, this book from uh, Peter Cree, The Cosmic Rays at Earth. I'm not sure you know it. Uh, for me, this is a vademecum for, for cosmic rays, but um, it's uh, hard stuff to read. But anyway, um, what I mentioned before uh, from the Pierre Auger Observatory, the design reports really, really helpful if you want to build uh, your own water Cherenkov detectors. And uh, yeah, these photomultipliers, uh, you won't believe, but they are still being built by two companies, uh, one in Japan, Hamamatsu, and another one is uh, located in the, U in, in the UK, it's ET Enterprises. And uh, especially from them, I got uh, a PDF, uh, which helped me really to understand uh, these uh, photomultiplier tubes, which uh, um, not really uh, something you are familiar today as an electronics engineer. So, um, yes, uh, very quick, I know, but um, hopefully you have an idea what uh, I am doing and I was doing with my water rank of detectors. So um, thanks a lot for your uh, patience and your audience and uh, I'm open for your questions. Thank you very much, Martin. Questions for Martin, please. Mm. Yeah, I have, I have a question, Martin. Um, working with filter multipliers is a bit scary for some of us because of the uh, high voltage involved and, uh, and controlling the high voltage. I guess we're looking at about 1,200, 1,500 volts um, for the to drive the photomultiplier. Um, have you had a look at the, um, at the uh, an array of, um, si of um, silicon photomultipliers? Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I had, I had some difficulties under understanding you because uh, there seem to be some disturbances in my internet connection. Um, yes, you are right. Uh, the, um, the power supply for these uh, photomultipliers is indeed an, an issue. We are talking about uh, 1.3 to 1.4 kilovolt. So this is uh, nothing you want to experience on your hands. And the, the second part of my question, and 
it may be my connection, internet connection, that's not very good. We've had real problems in the last couple of days here. Um, the second part of my question was whether you have come across or explored yourself a solid state array of um, photomultipliers rather than a, um, a, a, a photomultiplier tube. Yes, this is something uh, the guys from ET Enterprises uh, introduced me to. Um, to, to. To simply answer your questions, yes, that uh, that might be a possible uh, alternative, uh, but uh, in fact, uh, just by by a little bit of luck, I got my hands on a, a bunch of about uh, ninety of these photomultiplier tubes. So uh, the solid state uh, <laughs> detectors uh, had not been an option for me. <laughs> yeah, I understand. Okay, yeah. I have a couple of questions on the on the chat. Um, another person asking about photo um, silicon photomultipliers. Um, how often do you change the water in the detector flasks? Never, never, <laughs> because because I do not uh, get. Uh, a large amount of dust uh, into that uh, uh, into that uh, these flasks. What I do need to do to do is to re uh, refill them because uh, I lose uh, some water, and that's the reason why in the the second version of my uh, my detector setup, I uh, uh, use the detector for the for the water level because uh, I. I have the, the photomultiplier tubes in direct contact to the water. So these tubes uh, are dipped into the water. And um, if, if, I, if I lose uh, water, then I have a, a, a gap um, of, uh, of air between the, the photomultiplier tubes and the, and the water. And this means uh, additional attenuation. So I do not change the water. I just refill it. But what, what is important is that uh, you use uh, distilled water. Okay, um, another question from Sajed. Uh, can you please give an estimate of cost? Uh, yeah, yes, that, that's, that's uh, um, not easy to answer because <laughs> uh, I'm, I, I'm not sure the, about the, the, the current price for new photomultiplier tubes but if you look on the, on the internet uh, like this uh, e point 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 uh, um, company you can get uh, these uh, pmts uh, as a surplus uh, equipment for let's say 50 60 euros uh, per item so I think um, this is something as an amateur, which is possible uh, to spend, uh, but surely not for, for uh, new photomultiplier tubes. Okay, I've got no more questions in the, in the chat. Are there any more questions directly for Martin? Case, I'm going to ask if uh, Andrew's still on the on the Zoom. Are there any questions in general around anything either of our speakers this evening have said? Just to confirm, I'm uh, I've uh, unmuted and turned my video back on. Yeah, Andrew. Um, I I was. I mean, I've I've always been impressed with the um apparently you've achieved in what seems to me to be quite a short space of time um, what is what's next I, I'm, I'm i'm guessing it's getting the phased array working is that right well the phased array works that's the the military one that's uh what's producing my uh, uh my maps and uh, dark matter stuff uh that uh, is my main uh, workhorse uh, with that one i'm just extending the map as far as i can and also increasing its resolution um, because uh, most of the stuff was done just on two days. Um, so that, that, and I started drilling a lot more holes in my little bits of wood that define elevation choices. 
so I can get to different settings. Uh, but uh, in reality, though, I've I've already uh, demonstrated the major bits and pieces there. Um, then, uh, uh, but uh, if I, I I'm going to try and increase the uh, the length of time collecting signal to a week, so to see if I can get better signal to noise ratios. Uh, the other thing is um, I'm going to set the radio Jove up, try and get that working. But the the big challenge there is to find some way of setting the aerials up so that it passes through the uh, she who must be obeyed actually says yes to allow <laughs> them to go up in the garden. And I, I think I'm going to just try one actually on its own and uh, and just try and stick it next to the trees. I mean, all, all this is supposed to be what you're not supposed to do, but who knows? Maybe I can get it to, to work. Um, then I've got the interferometer, which uh, I want to try and... Uh, get working and um, that's been my uh my, my biggest problem getting that working we, we discovered the other day that the ad8302 board i've got has got some major issues with it it's got wrong voltages so it looks like i've been trying to get something working where the board wasn't working properly unfortunately the quality control on this stuff isn't very good as is it we only pay six pounds for it but you get quality control that goes along with a six pound board rather than a 60 pound board so i've ordered another one of those but i suppose apart from that um, I, I've got to go back to work. <laughs> and so the amount of time I've got to actually do this stuff is going to become much less. Yes. So everything's going to take a lot longer to get anywhere from now on. Sure. There, there's a question on the chat. Um, I think this is perhaps more addressed to Martin. Have you considered placing the photomultiplier under the water column? I, I think that by that means and at the bottom of the tube so that it always remains coupled to the water no matter how much evaporates. Yes, I have. Uh, but because of uh, the uh, radioactive uh, radiation, um, I decided uh, not to put it uh, under the, uh, the water cylinder, but uh, above. And under the water cylinder, I have actually uh, a, a piece of uh, lead for, for dampening. Um, there's a comment from me, Martin. Uh, how big is your lead? <laughs> About uh, one uh, centimeter. Ah, it's not enough. Oh. No, um, I, I'm going to speak as if I've got expertise here. It, uh, this, I'm just uh, repeating here what I've been told by uh, the main guy that does the co cosmic web, uh, so cosmic watch stuff. Uh, I, I forget, uh, is it MIT or something wherever they're they're based? Um, apparently you need five centimetres. And if you've got less than five centimetres, there's a risk that, ironically, the background radiation goes up, apparently, rather than down. Yes. So, uh, unfortunately, yes. if you have 70 millimetres across, you're going to need a centimetre or two spare. So you're probably looking at about uh, 10 centimetres uh, around, aren't you, and five centimetres deep. So you're probably going to need 20 or 30 kilograms of lead to do that. Yes, that's right. That's right. And uh, this is something I was not really willing uh, to do. Um, so spending a lot of money for for uh, simply lead. Um, so th that's that's the reason why I I uh, inter um, use this uh, discriminator uh, to to cut off uh, to cut off hopefully most of this uh, background radiation. Or you could just accept that the background radiation level is likely to be reasonably constant. And therefore, yes, although that yes. doesn't give you exact muon level, the relative changes are probably going to be representative. Yes, that's that's right. That's right. Uh, so I'm I'm sure that I, I lose uh, uh, some uh, uh, cosmic ray, some muons with a lower energy. Um, but uh, I think uh, in in the beginning, this is something I can uh, I can risk. Uh, because uh, in the beginning, and just I just want to see, uh, am I able to to de to really detect cosmic radiation, which I'm still not sure about. Uh, I I would seriously question how much you lose with a few centimeters of air at the top. I mean, the the one issue you've got is that muons are traveling at relativistic velocities anyway, and if that's high enough to allow them to transmit 20 kilometers of uh, atmosphere, it's certainly going to get through five or 10 centimeters of additional atmosphere. Yeah, I think so. Um, uh, can I make a comment to David Summon here? Can people hear me? Certainly can. Oh, thanks. I've, I've been following the discussion on the, um, on the, on the email threads about the, um, 
muon backgrounds and muons from above and below and i'm i'm a bit puzzled by by, by what people's concerns are and whether there's a sort of a a, a mixture of um terminology here about well, let's say muons from below as opposed to background from below um I, I looked online and I found some papers from a Japanese detector, Kamiya Kan from what big professional neutrino detector from what two, two and a half decades back, measuring muon rates from below, i.e. through through the earth. And they're they're tiny from an enormous detector. Um and I don't think <clears throat> it's the kind of thing that that we're ever likely to detect with the cosmic watch detectors, if you like. Background for sure, but muons I'm almost certainly convinced not. So I'm not I'm not sure I understand what people's concerns are about putting lead beneath the detector, if you like. So David, um, th these other radiations, do you think they're likely to set off the cosmic watch? Oh, oh, background like stuff for sure. I mean, the whole point of having a pair of the cosmic watches is actually to try and give you a pretty high proportion of muons as opposed to anything else. If you've got a single detector, who knows what you're getting? You know, any ionizing related radiation is going to uh, set off the, um, the 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 silicon device. Um, so it's all about reducing that kind of thing. Um, I, I and the broad point I take from a lot of this is that if if we're ever going to each between us when we set up our own detectors, try and get some sort of comparative baseline that, that would be meaningful, what would be the configuration that we would adopt? In other words, if we've got a pair of the detectors, are we just going to stand them on top of each other or are we going to space them a certain distance apart, i.e. getting some kind of standard effectively? I mean, I, I know that the kind of figures I get are sort of broadly representative of what the others are, are reporting online. You know, the coincidence rate of, you know, roughly one, what I might call a real in inverted commas muon, maybe every seven or eight seconds, roughly speaking. Um, um, but of course, it does depend on, you know, as as in the the, the paper that the that, that Axel put up online. You know, if you put the things side by side or twist them or offset them you, you can check you can you can tune this in all sorts of different ways um but at least it appeared to me that what i was getting roughly corresponded to whatever other people were getting uh, and that that's a useful starting point but actually if, if we're ever going to move beyond sort of individual um measurements and try and combine them in some sort of way having that standard configuration and probably some notion of a standard timing, you know, details to be discussed yeah. and probably not for here, but, uh, <laughs> but as a point of principle, if you like, is, is, is how do we move beyond the sort of slightly informal approach to let's say tightening things up a bit in a, in a way that would actually be, be constructive. Um, <laughs> well, the, uh, the cosmic watch uh, science paper, sort of that, um, massive uh, yeah, yeah, for sure, yeah. document he, he certainly points out that if you place the detectors so that the scintillators are next door to each other yeah in cases compared to in the case <laughs> of each other that you can get a measurable difference in detection rates oh, I, I, absolutely. absolutely i mean and, and as a sort of a, <laughs> as a sort of a, 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 of a of a pathological case if you like for the last five or six days i've been running a pair of horizontally about 1.2 meters apart just to see what sort of coincidence rates i get and and it's low but it's not zero uh and you can say what are the possible sources of that um <laughs> one of which is background you know just random coincidence and there's going to be a proportion of that um i i almost guarantee there are no genuine horizontal muons going through although one could do the calculation about you know how much atmosphere might they have to traverse but, I'm all, but I suspect actually more likely is what's happening is that there are occasional coincidences just due to different particles with a common origin within a shower that are coming down with a footprint bigger than a metre or a bit. Now, yep. you know, this is never going to be very precise because our, our detectors are small, low mass, low resolution. But I think we have to understand where the context in which we can operate them and actually generate some 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 more meaningful data and, and then quantify that in some sense and i noted that there was a strand of discussion a while back on on how might we um you know ascribe a proper statistical error to the kind of counting measurements that we're making and there are standard techniques for doing this um 
And I think that there will be some merit in trying to get a bit of consensus on, on, on this so that we could get, you know, sensible comparisons going. Could I, could I just chip in on behalf of the, the Muon Forum? Um, I think, I think I've said this somewhere before, a discussion about statistical techniques and how to how to mangle your data such that you you can tell whether it means something is way beyond anything I I have ever met. Um, I'm quite sure there are statistical techniques that are applicable. I'd love to organise perhaps an informal online session to talk about statistics and data uh, processing for sure so let me let me check one thing back andrew just just on a basic um you know the kind of radioactive decay kind of statistics that um that the normal way of doing it is just to take the square root of the number of counts you've got in a standard interval which for the detection rates that i'm getting means that i need to accumulate data for roughly 10 to 15 minutes to give me something in the region of a hundred counts of which the statistical error is therefore the square root of that or 10 and therefore a 10% measure. You know, that's, mm -hmm. I mean, the technical term is Poisson statistics, okay. but you know, the, this can be looked up, but that, that seems to be the standard way of doing it. Um, you know, the, the danger is if you, if you take a period much smaller than that, the proportional errors gets much bigger. And if you integrate for longer, of course, your statistics get better, but other things may be changing in the background, depending mm -hmm. on what you're trying to measure. So there's a balance there. Mm -hmm. Can I ask if uh, the if some sort of setup was set a bit like RMOB for radio meteor scatter, so that different observers could actually all uh, we had some method of having live uploads of data onto those uh, onto that site now i know this wouldn't necessarily include statistical measurements however you could look down the different observers and if you saw a a change in muon count that was occurring over multiple people then that would i'd have thought would have strongly indicated that something real had happened i think there's an interesting route to all of that but um there's quite there's quite a lot of things sort of hidden behind that question, if you like. As I was alluding to earlier, if you move your detectors further apart, effectively their field of view reduces and therefore your count reduces. So if everybody isn't doing the same thing, then you've got a big problem of Okay. You, so, well, so, you've, got, you've got two issues. Either you correct for some norm between comparing different people's measurements, or you have a standard configuration. You know, either way it would work. Yep. Um, but also, of course, depending on the, you know, the, the global distribution of people doing measurements, of course, on the surface of the Earth, they're all pointing in different directions. So there's a whole host of things that would need to be factored mm -hmm. into that in order to, to, to actually extract something meaningful. This is clearly not the place to go into the details, but these are all the kind of things that really yes. would need to be thought about if one ever wanted to aggregate data in a sensible scientific way. I go and suggest uh, two websites for people. One is called Muon Pi, spelt as it sounds, which is a project running um, one of the universities in Germany, which has got a number of detectors around Europe. I think there's one in Anglesey. And their website shows you graphically where you've got coincidence between detections in two different locations. It's quite an interesting interesting thing to watch, and they happen rather more frequently. I haven't really delved into the, the details, mm. but it is an, an interesting website, and their detector is um, a bigger surface area of scintillator and a totally, totally different design with significantly different and better timing um, built into it. And, and that that that's an interesting point, Andrew, in the sense that if if ever we we as individuals wish to make some uh, some stab at comparing to what others are doing, it almost compels you to try and make an estimate of what absolute rate that you might be measuring with your given setup at your location, and that implies a bunch of corrections which then need to be thought through about. Mm -hmm. You know, based on what your particular configuration is, how would you convert that uh, due to the sort of physical geometry effects and 
fields of view, blah, 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 and statistical things so that you will might make an estimate of what your real rate was in a given direction at a given time that then could form part of a database that, that would enable you to make meaningful comparisons with what others were doing. Because I think without that, there'd be so much variability. You you just yeah. end up with persistent cycles of questions, which which ultimately <laughs> probably don't go anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I, I think there's quite a lot to dis, to think about. And there is in that. Um, I I wonder. I, I mean, Paul. I mean, I I haven't booked yet, but um, I I I have been to the uh, the Winchester meetings at uh, of the BAA for for a good few years now, and in fact, that's where I bought my detectors from last year. So, uh, might it be interesting to have a sort of a face to face um, between and those of us who might be there um, and perhaps think this through a bit more. I think that's definite possibility. One of the things that I've been that's been going around the back of my mind for uh, maybe eighteen months now is ultimately when there are enough um, detectors out there, then to collect events that are GPS and time stamped and overlaid and compared with the um, with the defined geometry that you very eloquently spoke of earlier, David, um, and a methodology that makes some sense of this, and then uh, applying some statistics with, a, you know, with knowledge greater than mine on that subject. Um, I, I think there's a lot of mileage to be had and a lot of very interesting um, science that can be done with the um, with the detectors and bringing that data together. So, yeah, I'd be very happy to maybe even facilitate such a meeting um, face to face somewhere. And Winchester is a is, is is a good place as any. Some of us will be it, at it's a place where something could happen anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Even if it's just a few people. I mean, we've got the forum where ideas can be then um, discussed more. Um, more widely, particularly with those that wouldn't make face-to-face -face meetings. I think having some kind of, you know, some some really as simple as it could may be a baseline that would that would help people sort of um, align themselves with what others were doing without getting too heavy. Yeah. Yes. Right. I'm going to hold my hand up and say, fascinating. Yes, I will be at Winchester. Love love to talk further with anybody who's there. Um, are there any questions or I've got to, uh, I've just raised my, night? rise my hands just a, a little. Yes. Um, I obviously built one of these uh, muon detectors. I've got the other one I never built yet. So I haven't had <laughs> any coincidence. But when I uh, put it near my uh, radioactive watch, I found it was very poor energy um, discrimination. It just so happens that last year, I, and I put a, um, I put a link in the uh, comments. I discovered radio, radiocode.com in Cyprus. Now, it doesn't have a coincidence input, but it is a silicon photomultiplier with a scintillator. And I just wanted to show you the spectrum that I got from my dad's uh, watch. That's radium. And it shows the sort of uh, energy discrimination it gets. And... Um, I was bought this by my good wife for Christmas. Um, <laughs> uh, it's a handheld battery operated detector, connects by Bluetooth to your phone. It costs um, 259 euros plus VAT. And I've actually sent it back because they've introduced another one, which has got better resolution for an extra 40 euros. And I'm expecting it back in the post very soon. Now, I know it's not the same as Muton muon detection but i know a lot of people are interested in radioactivity i just wanted to mention it in passing cheers guys <laughs> let us know how you get on uh tony yes um norman's got his hand up for a question right i'll just unmute can you hear me we yeah. can good there's been on the website talk about using lead the shielding at this moment in time, I have an opportunity for a quantity of scrap lead. 
Roofing lead. My son's a builder or works in the building trade. But more interestingly, he's got the facilities for melting lead and casting from one of the things he, um, he dabbled in several years ago. So, well, interestingly, he says, once you get past a couple of centimetres thick, use sheet and butt joint the lead and weld it. He's got an oxyacetylene torch so he can weld it. And importantly, he's got a, a shield with forced air, filtered forced air. So you're not breathing the fumes that you're creating. I wonder if somebody can give me an indication of what sort of an area, I'm presuming it's going to be sufficient for the standard cosmic watch muon detector with one st stacked on top of it. There may or may not be some merit in putting walls around it, bearing in mind at this moment in time, lead is free issued to me. So it will come with a cost. And I've got a keen son who's keen to uh, play around. The payback for me is gardening for him. And, uh, but anyway, if somebody can give me an indication through Paul or Andrew as to uh, useful pieces of lead because I'm well aware that the same amount of work, we can either build a useless piece of test equipment or something that is, or could be of use. Um, I've, uh, yes. having uh, perhaps rather silly signed myself up to talk about muon detectors at Astrofest in uh, Kensington at the beginning of February, I have therefore to, so I don't look like a complete idiot, I've started reading in uh, great detail through all the paperwork on the Cosmic Watch website. And there is a uh, somewhere in there that tells the amount that they used to basically switch off uh, all the extraneous sources of radiation. If you send me an email on andrew at thornet.net, T-H-O. I'll do that, Andrew. And I will look at look that up and send it back to you. But the most important thing is that it needs to cover the entire bottom of your detector and perhaps be a, a little bit bigger um, and it needs to be at least five centimetres thick. And I think they're five centimetres or two inches. We're getting into kilograms. But it's solid, solid five yes. centimetres, two inches. Um, the, the way they've described it in the, in the paper was they, uh, it's either the science paper or one of the other documents, is that they actually put it uh, around uh, everything except the top in order to do a comparison of detection rates. But what they told me when I wrote to them was that it was underneath was the bit that really mattered because the idea of the coincidence is to try and remove the other the other directions. Would this be for one cosmic watch detector? No, because it well, for both, because you've got them on top of each other. Yep. So you just need it underneath the bottom one. Hmm. That's how I understand it anyway. But um so the guys that have already spoken but Please correct me if I've got that wrong. Whoa, whoa. A quick, quick question, Andrew. Was that in the science paper? I'm feeling actually. Though I said science paper, I'm feeling it isn't in the science paper. I think. I mean, if, if you give me a moment, you carry on talking about something else. I might I'd have it here. One minute. I have a feeling that it's in the back of the instructions. Um, they did some stuff testing it on a beam line somewhere in the state stanford yeah i, I, I guess my, yeah. my immediate back then well my my question is actually what it, what it, what would its purpose be is it actually just to reduce the effects of extraneous backgrounds i.e from the surroundings um because it clearly can't do anything about the muons <laughs> no um actually if 
on the subject of upward going muons, um, I don't quite sure how I found this, but there is an experiment flown in Antarctica called ANITA, A-N-I-T-A. -A. Um, a quick Google will find its Wikipedia page. Mm. And that was to, oh, it, fl it flies a very incredibly sensitive antenna for months on end from a balloon. And the idea was to look for detection of radio signals from reflections from the ice. But every now and again, it would detect it made some detections of clearly upward going signals, not reflected signals. It's quite an, and there are, I think I found something on archive as well. Uh, but, so it's quite Andrew, an interesting thing. If it's sensitive to radio, it, it can't be detecting muons. Ah, it's de you have to read the whole thing. Okay. <laughs> um, it is some, uh, it's an, another detection technique. Um, no, I'm not going to speculate because I can't remember. I'm just okay, trying I mean, to find the Wikipedia page. What, I, what I'm trying to do is sort of connect the thinking to to what I've read about the what what this big professional detector Cameo Can did, and where you know their their thoughts about upward going muons are essentially related to neutrino oscillations, which that's, is something that which is something that it. we are never going to pick those up with our detectors. They're too small. But, uh... No, it was a it's dear. Can't find the web page now, which is infuriating. Uh, no matter, it'll come to you, Andrew. But I would it be will interested come to, in, will in come a point to me when you get post it, yeah, it somewhere. Thanks, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, the, one, the one thing I, I I'm having difficulty finding that uh, that information, but the uh, the one thing I do remember because I asked the question specifically, sent him an email and asked it, is his main comment was, "Does it really matter?" Because you're likely to have a similar background rate of radiation regardless so if you're looking for just changes and, and that would be the one comment i would make a absolute measurements of muons are going to depend surely uh on so many variable factors yeah and and, even and within the ones that the ukra are making scintillators and things are going to vary in quality sure. and efficiency and i think that's why some sense of the direction in, of travel in terms of what we're trying to measure would be helpful in which case you can then you can throw away stuff that, that that you're never going to be sensitive to and just concentrate on the corrections that you might make that might might matter um given the scale of what we're doing you know that there is a danger that you can get bogged down in stuff which is just never going to make any difference uh, <laughs> I, think I, the, I think it's I, likely I, to be something of interest but not necessarily of any importance I think a um, another comment I think that came out of a previous discussion, I think it was centered around dead time. But the one of the things is count if you count the coincidence externally, um, you can do it with a considerably much shorter and more sensitive time time gate than you can do with the two Arduino nanos. Yeah, um, I, which is probably a better way of getting rid of extraneous nonsense than. That, that that I think Andrew is true, but but if the if the if the if the background rate and the real detection rate are low enough, it actually doesn't make much difference. Well, this is true. <laughs> yes, unless you live in Aberdeen. Right. Okay. Um, if anyone wants to contact Norman, please drop me an email post something on the forum and i will make sure that the message gets gets through to him um if there's no more uh questions or comments i send an email to andrew thorn it thorn it okay and i'll copy you okay doke. i i suggest we close for the evening yeah thank you Thank well, you. Thank Cheerio. you to both of our speakers. Um, good talks. It's great to have presentations from within, within our own community, rather than having to rely on visiting experts, great as they are. Um, thank you, everybody, for attending. I think that it was an incredibly well attended meeting as well. So it just proves that people speaking from within our own numbers can command a good audience. If anyone's nervous, there's a good audience out there for you. Oh, yes. So thank you very much, everybody.
and good night. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.